Our next speaker is Silverio Johnson from Brown University. Uh, the title of his talk is Dilute Swarmers Have Different Run and Tumble Motility Than Plactonic Swimmers in Enterobacter SPSM3. All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, like she said, my name is Silverio Johnson. Um, I'm uh, doing my PhD studies at Brown University. I'm a fifth year, and I'm working with uh, Professor J.X. Tang in the physics department. And before I get into uh, sort of the meat of my talk, I'd like to preface this by saying that I'm very honored to be presenting here in front of you at this con uh, conference. And I've just been continuously humbled by the amount of biology that I've learned. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I've always loved biology. I haven't heard quite this much since AP biology back in, in high school. <laughs> But uh, hopefully today, um, I can share with you a little bit of the physics uh, behind the biology and share with you why I love biophysics, which really takes um, all of the physics training that I've learned over the years and applies it to biological systems. And so the, uh, the system that I'm interested in studying is this enterobacter, um, this newly isolated species of bacteria, um, and really try to figure out um, what are the difference in the uh, so-called run and tumble parameters between uh, the, sw the swimming and the swarming phenotype of the species? And so <laughs> if, I had a, if I had a little bit more time for my talk, I might go around the room and ask you what are some of the key differences between these, these two images and some of the things that you might blurt out or that, you know, this, this fellow on the right, this gentleman, he's clearly swimming at an accelerated speed through a body of water and he's doing so on his own. Whereas these maybe not so gentle men and women are very, uh, they're at a high population density. They're very, um, they have very strong interactions and maybe this is occurring over a solid surface like cement or something of the sort. And so with bacteria, we have a very similar, but not completely similar um, phenomenon. Uh, there are many different modes of bacterial motility, but in our lab, we mostly focus on two forms of bacterial motility, uh, namely swimming and swarming. And for us, there are many different uh, types of bacteria and the ways that they are, um, there are bacteria with fl flagella, with pili. I'm sure you understand this is a biological audience. Um, <laughs> But we, I work primarily with peritrichous bacteria that have many flagellum uh, distributed over the cell body. And so in the swimming phenotype, what we have is a cell moving itself as an individual through some uh, form of aqueous media by rotating flagella. And because of hydrodynamic drag, these things come together behind the cell and form uh, somewhat of a bundle as it propels itself forward. And that's what this video is really good for. I wonder if I could play it again. Let's see. Here we go. So you can see that they're moving uh, through the liquid with their bundle. And then every so often, one of the flagellum leaves the bundle and it's able to reorientate in another direction. This is called run and tumble. Uh, on the right, we have the swarming motility where we see we're dealing with a very different system. Usually it occurs over a solid substrate uh, such as agar but it's not completely um, only solid. They, they move through a thin film of liquid that they um, sort of sap out of the agar, uh, the nutrient-rich agar, as they, they propagate over the plate. And so you end up with these very uh, dense swarms moving quickly uh, over the surface with many intercellular interactions. And so this is probably the most biological slide out of anything I'm going to show you here today. This is what inspired the work to study specifically SM3. We have a collaborator in New York at the Albert Einstein Medical College who isolated this bacteria from the feces of mice that they studied. And they actually did an experiment where they, um, they treated, uh, they, they induced uh, colitis symptoms in the mice. Um, they fed them, I believe, uh, dextrin, DDS, in order to give them these uh, colitis uh, symptoms. And then they treated them with a control. 
believe it was just water or some nutrient solution. And then they also treated them with the same solution, but with SM1 and SM3 included in the, in the concoction. And SM1 is a uh, very related species to SM3, except that it doesn't form this, it doesn't uh, perform this swarming phenotype. And so what they found is that SM3, which does perform this uh, swarming phenotype, uh, shows markedly um, reduced inflammation scores for the mice that, that were suffering from colitis and also uh, weight loss. So there, there's some uh, very strongly swarm-dependent um, link between this reduction of these IBD-related uh, symptoms. And so as physicists, we, we looked at this and we said, I wonder if there's any uh, physical mechanism behind why that's occurring. And since this is a, a completely brand new novel species, uh, we took it from the basics and I started studying them in the swimming phenotype primarily. And so by studying the motility of SM3, the hope is that we can better understand the mechanisms by which it ameliorates IBD. And then also um, sort of the, the golden question in bacterial motility is what exactly is the connection between swimming and swarming? because swarming is this, uh, this phenotype that is due to many different seemingly unrelated uh, phenomena. And you have the, the biochemical um, aspects like quorum sensing, uh, the uh, exopolysaccharide materials that the cells excrete that, that affect the viscosity of the fluid that they're moving through. You have the, the, the actual like, physical interactions, which we're interested in between like the alignment of cells and the flagellum. So this is a very hard question, one that I'm not going to answer today, uh, but this is definitely a start. And so what do we see when we look under the microscope? This is a movie of SM3 under face contrast microscopy at 40x and 100 frames per second. And you can see that it, it does sort of a very prototypical run and tumble motion. It comes in from the left on a run. It pauses, rotates and goes off into another direction. And this is the frame by frame trajectory of what we observed. See it comes in and then it goes off at 63 degrees. And so this is sort of the schematic behind run and tumble. Uh, one of the, when, when the flagellum are all turning in the same uh, motor configuration, in the case of SM3 counterclockwise, it's able to maintain this bundle but as soon as one switches into the clockwise configuration, the bundle dissociates and it's able to uh, reorient itself. And so the first step to understanding and trying to uh, extract some of the parameters of this run and tumble were to uh, take movies of these cells and then perform uh, some sort of tracking method to get their trajectory. And you can see on the left, uh, this is SM3 uh, captured at 25 frames per second at 10x using dock field microscopy. And you can see that for the, um, the swimming cell, this is a cell that was just grown um, in some nutritional medium in a shaking incubator and then plated on a microscope slide. You can see that its trajectory is very jagged. There are a lot of uh, tumbles. Whereas this is a cell that was grown in a swarm on a plate uh, we picked a little bit of it from the swarm front, diluted it, and then did the same tracking procedure. And you can see that in comparison, its trajectory is very smooth. Uh, maybe there are only one or two tumbles in this whole trajectory of comparable lengths. And so this is an interesting observation. And so we automated the tracking of these cells. Uh, me and an undergraduate in the lab wrote a, a tracking algorithm in Python, and we were able to produce trajectories such as this one that was extracted from this movie, uh, in which the algorithm basically goes through the trajectory and it denotes all of the potential tumbles in the trajectory. And the way that it does that is it basically uh, uh, determines the velocity as a function of time, the profile of the velocity as a function of time, also the angular velocity, how much it, it turns as a function of time. And then it basically just says, okay, 
look at the velocity profile. If one of these dips satisfies this criteria, the depth of the dip divided by the minimum, if that's greater than some empirical value that we chose from observation, then denote it as a tumble. But there's a further criterion. Not only does it have to follow uh, this criteria, it also has to be the case that the dip in linear velocity uh, directly corresponds to a peak in angular velocity. And so that's how we go through these trajectories and uh, determine what is a tumble, what is and what is not a tumble. And so some of the data that we have um, that we procured is displayed here. You can see that the swimming cells perform uh, tumbles. Uh, to, they have a tumble time of 0.12 seconds on average. The, the segment between tumbles, the run time, is on average of a second, 0.77 seconds. And they have a tumble angle of 69 degrees. Um, for the swarming cells, the tumble time is, is very identical, but the runs are extended and the tumble angle is decreased. And this increase in the run time is something that has been shown in the literature time and time again. Uh, but what we found interesting is the reduction of the tumble angle, which is something that hasn't gotten so much in, uh, emphasis in the literature. And so we wanted to apply a physical model as to why the tumble angle might be reduced. And we took probably one of the simplest approaches. Swarming cells tend to be longer than swimming cells on average. Once they differentiate into the swarming phenotype, uh, genes are upregulated that uh, promote hyperflagellation, multinucleation, uh, the elongation of these cells. Um, and so our idea was, well, they're bigger, so they should, be, they should experience more drag. And therefore, for a given uh, motor torque, they should be, uh, only be able to sweep through a limited range of angles compared to their swimming uh, counterparts. And so we modeled the cells, which are pill-shaped as uh, prolate ellipsoids experiencing viscous drag. I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty, but basically what you end up with is this relation between the net torque caused by the flagellum on the cell body and uh, these variables, uh, some that have to do with geometry, uh, like this uh, rotational friction factor, the semi-major and semi-minor axis, semi axis of the cell, and then also the angular velocity. And so if you just look at this expression, you can see that omega is inversely proportional to the cell length. And that was one of the major findings of our, of our work. And so the main conclusion, swarming cells which are longer than swimming cells on average rotate less for a given torque. And this has recently been accepted and is in the final stages of revision. So hopefully, if you're interested in this, you'll be able to find it in uh, physical review E. And I've run out of time, so I'll just quickly say this, that this was all done in 2D. We want to do some 3D tracking techniques, uh, which is sort of the state of the art in microbial tracking. Um, and then also, it would be great to do some fluorescent studies of live SM3 flagella to directly observe some of the mechanics that we just infer from physical intuition. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to my talk. Yeah, that was great. Um, do we have we have time for one more question? Yes, Gigi, I can. I mean, this is very interesting for me because I was studying the something moving inside of the cell. So, so what I understand, my physical mind is, if the cells are bigger, the angles are lower, right? Like they just move because they're so big. But at the beginning, you show us like swarming. You need a lot of population around them. So I'm just curious about the angles wise. If you have more crowd like you and trying to do the swarming, not the swimming then do you see the angles are changing or the cell size are changing? Yeah, no, that's an, um, an interesting question. So if I can sort of summarize your question, the, you're basically asking what is the relation between this decrease in the, the tumble angle and the swarming phenotype? Um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, one of the theories that I like the most is that if you were to... Um, 
take this movie and put like a little uh, water droplet on an area um, and dilute the swarm, you'll actually see that they form these dynamic packs. So there'll be like three or four cells in, in what's called a raft. And they're dynamic because cells can leave one raft and then go to another. And it's a very interesting movie to look at. And one of the theories that I like is that the reason that they maybe upregulate genes to increase cell length is not only because we see in abiotic systems, uh, such as just, uh, let's say, carbon uh, nanotubes, that if you increase the aspect ratio, they'll just naturally want to align with one another. So you have this uh, align, uh, passive alignment due to increased aspect ratio, which is beneficial for the cells um, in forming these rafts. Um, but also, if they're um, tumbling with less frequency, they're disrupting those rafts uh, less severely, and they're able to maintain cohesion to one another. So these are some ideas that kind of get thrown around, but nothing is concretely proven because it's, it's very complicated to differentiate between what's chemistry, biology, and what's phys what, what is the most important factor here? Thank you so much.